I don't know how you experienced this week, but for me, it felt like a steady barrage of bad news. It felt like we were under assault, almost. We had the terrorist assault on the Kabul airport in Afghanistan, which took the lives of 13 servicemen and women and scores of Afghan civilians. A massive hurricane bearing down on the Gulf Coast. And closer to home, we face the onslaught of COVID cases in our area, including 16 deaths this past week alone at Archibald Hospital. 16 people died. Frontline workers in our hospitals are suffering some of the same traumas that soldiers and medics experience in a war zone. Even something as boring and innocuous as school board meetings, please don't be offended if you serve on a school board, but even something as boring and innocuous as that have become battlefields in our era with parents, educators, elected officials, and healthcare professionals duking it out. It feels like we are at war on so many fronts at the same time, at home and abroad. And as Christians, we have two responses to this. First, I think one way that sometimes Christians will respond to this is by getting completely absorbed in these conflicts and letting them overburden us to the point of despair. We can forget that beneath every strife, every conflict on this earth, there is a spiritual war raging. The greatest trick in the devil's playbook is to convince us that he doesn't exist. As Dr. Lloyd-Jones puts it, I am certain that one of the main causes of the ill state of the church today is the fact that the devil is being forgotten. All is attributed to us. We are ignorant of this great objective fact, the being, the existence of the devil. When we ignore the reality of spiritual evil, when we just focus on all the conflict and destruction we see around us, and we don't acknowledge that there is a spiritual conflict going on, we do so at our own peril. So that's one response we can have as Christians. The other response we can have as Christians is that of Paul in Ephesians 6. When we see conflict and battle all around, we can use it as a reminder that we are always engaged in a spiritual battle. In Ephesians 6, Paul says that we are at war. We are in the middle of a battle against a fierce enemy. Satan is real and he wants to destroy everyone around us. He wants to destroy us. He wants to destroy our friends and neighbors and families. As Paul puts it, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. This is where our battle lies. And when we're awakened to this reality that we are living in a battlefield, it brings clarity to the Christian life. The Ephesians that Paul is addressing were well aware of this spiritual battle. They, they likely remembered the incident of some Jewish exorcists who were trying to cast out demons. And there's this one demon-possessed man, and they're trying to cast out the demons. But instead, the demon-possessed man overpowers those Jewish exorcists, and they have to run away naked and wounded, is what Scripture tells us in Acts 19. But they'd also seen Paul cast out demons in the name of Jesus and perform countless miracles. The Ephesians witnessed personally sorcerers who converted to the Christian faith, taking their spell books, laying them at the feet of Paul, and lighting them on fire. They knew that this was a spiritual battle. They had seen the fruit of a spiritual battle. I wonder, do we know that we are in a spiritual battle. Do we know that? Or are we so focused on everything happening in the world that we've forgotten that we are in a spiritual battle? Now, before we talk about the armor of God, we need to understand that we are in a spiritual battle. We need to know the reason why we need armor of God. This world is full of powerful forces forces that want to destroy the creatures of God. 
Paul calls them rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers over this present darkness. Jesus, when he was talking about the devil, he referred to him as the ruler of this world. The Apostle John said, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Ultimately, the forces of the devil will lose the war. We know that as Christians. We know that their fate is doomed. But for now, in the time that we live in, these usurpers have not conceded defeat or been destroyed. John Stott helpfully summarizes our current situation like this. He says, there will be no cessation of hostilities, not even a temporary truce or ceasefire until the end of life or of history when the peace of heaven is attained. The whole of the interim period between the Lord's two comings is to be characterized by conflict. In other words, we shouldn't be surprised about conflict in the world. That's the normal state that Christians live in. We are always in conflict. We are always in the midst of a battle. Even though the power of the devil and the spiritual forces of evil have been broken by Jesus' death and resurrection, they continue to try to subvert, to try to sabotage, to try to wreak havoc and spread chaos on the earth. So Paul is very aware of this as he's writing Ephesians 6. He's writing from prison. He's literally bound up in chains because of the spiritual war that he's been waging. Now it would be easy, as Paul is sitting in prison, it would be easy for him and for the Ephesian Christians to feel very powerless, right? Their beloved leader is chained up to Roman guards. It would be easy for Paul and his readers to view those Roman guards as the enemy, as the ones that are oppressing them, because they were oppressing them. It would be easy to, for them to feel as if they're in a power struggle with these men in armor who quite literally have bound them up and are dragging them off to prison. But instead, Paul uses his imprisonment to redefine power for his readers and redefine the scope of the battlefield. Paul says that he is not in a struggle against the enemies of flesh and blood that have bound him up in chains. Paul is in a struggle for the flesh and blood that has him bound up in chains. Paul refers to himself in this passage as an ambassador in chains. Paul is not the captive of the Roman guards. Rather, the Roman guards are stuck with him. He's like, I've got a captive audience. They're chained to me. They can do nothing but listen to the gospel all day long. This is great. We're going to start doing that here at Trinity Anglican Church. We've got chains that we've ordered on Amazon. They'll be here soon. You guys are going to get a lot of gospel from me. But in all seriousness, look at the first verse in our passage, verse 10. Paul writes, finally, right? Here he is, chained up. He's a prisoner, right? This is what he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And that word finally is better translated henceforward. Henceforward, from now on, from now on, Paul is saying, you are going to survive the battle by the Lord's strength. From now on, it's not going to be by your strength. From now on, not by your strength, but by being strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. As Paul is looking at these heavily armored Roman guards standing around him in prison, he begins to transform the image of terror. Don't forget, this terrorized the early Christians. He takes this image of complete terror and transforms it into a positive image of the strength and power that Christians have. I want to show you an image of what that armor looked like. I think we've got, yeah, there's, there's our, our sketched out soldier, Roman soldier. You can see the different pieces of his armor, his equipment. And so he's starting, he's looking at these Roman soldiers decked out in all this gear. And he starts to say, this is actually how we are, spiritually. We may not have these flesh and blood weapons and armor, but we have spiritual weapons and armor. And I think it's important to note that the armor of God is the armor of God. 
This is the armor that belongs to God himself that he gives to us to stand in the battle, to survive the battle. Paul is drawing on Isaiah 59. So he's looking at these guards and he's meditating on scripture from Isaiah 59, which says this. It's from Isaiah 59. It displeased the Lord that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one and was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm brought him victory, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness like a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing, and wrapped himself in fury as in a mantle. Notice this isn't uh, Jesus petting a lamb and tossing some daisies in the air. This is an armed warrior ready to face his enemies. And in Christ, what Paul is saying is that is exactly how we are dressed. Spiritually, that is how we are dressed as Christians. So I want to look today with you at each of these pieces of armor and talk about how they defend us from the schemes of the enemy. How they keep us safe in the midst of a battle where the spiritual forces of wickedness are assaulting us. And so first, the belt of truth. So I don't know if we have that image again. Do we have that up there? Yeah. So the belt of truth, that's the little thing around his waist. It's got the little fringe hanging down there from it. The belt of truth. The soldier's belt, which is kind of like my own here, is what you use to keep yourself from tripping up. So they had these long tunics that they wore, and they needed a belt. The soldiers needed a belt that would hold up their tunic so that they didn't trip on it when they were in battle. They could not move freely in battle without first putting on this belt. And the Christian is exhorted to put on the belt of truth. Satan is the prince of lies. That's what scripture says. He distorts and deceives. And when we speak the truth, what we're doing is we are aligning ourselves with Jesus, who is the truth, and we're preventing Satan from tripping us up. So anytime we're speaking the truth, We're actually hitching up our garments so that we don't get tripped up by Satan. And this is so important in our friendships, in our workplaces, in our families, and especially in our church. We must cling to truth or else we are going to get tripped up. We're going to get tripped up over and over again. Being truthful keeps us from being tripped up and trapped and entangled in our lives. I don't know if anybody's ever done this. I'm sure none of you have ever done this, but if you've ever told a lie to cover for another lie, anybody out there ever done that? I've done it. Ever told a lie to cover for a lie? You know exactly what I'm talking about. You get trapped. You have to lie for the lie, and then you have to lie for the lie for the lie. And then it just keeps going and gets worse till it all falls apart like a house of cards. And our culture is filled with lies. And over the next 12 weeks, we're doing this sermon series on on 12 Tough Questions. We're going to be looking at a lot of those cultural lies and what the truth of God has to say about them. But let me tell you the most dangerous lie that I've ever encountered. And I see it trip people up time and time again. And it's, it's tripped me up time and time again. Here's the lie. It wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad. We tell ourselves this all the time about our sin, don't we? It wasn't that bad. It it really wasn't that bad. It wasn't as bad as what she did. It wasn't as bad as what he's doing over there. Or maybe you've heard the non-apology apology. apology. Have you heard one of those before? I'm sorry, but... (laughs) Really, it was the other person's fault. (laughs) I'm sorry your feelings got hurt. That's my favorite one. (laughs) And who hurt their feelings? Some amorphous person in the ether? No, you hurt their feelings. I'm sorry your feelings got hurt. That kind of apology doesn't accept responsibility. It plans blame on others. And what it really is doing is it's normalizing and minimizing sin. What we're doing when we do that, when we engage in that kind of deceit, is we're taking off the belt of truth and opening ourselves up to get tripped up by Satan. So that's the first thing, the belt of truth. We need to be truth tellers. 
if we're going to defeat the prince of lies, Satan. Second is the breastplate of righteousness. You can see it on his front. And there's this like popular Christian mythology that their backs weren't covered and it was like, oh, so you always stand facing forward or something? That's not true. The Roman breastplate actually covered your back. Um, so it's, it's full protection. It's not, a, it's not partial protection. But, but it's the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate of righteousness. All of us face temptation. And Satan is the tempter. He's the tempter. And as Christians, we look to Jesus, who is tempted in every single way that we are, but did not sin. When we come to Christ, our bondage to sin is broken, and it's possible for us to be righteous. What, what does righteous mean? It means doing the right thing, acting with justice. It becomes possible for us to do the right thing, to have good conduct and character. The righteousness of Christ is like armor that protects our hearts from being so assaulted that we can do nothing but sin. I want to be clear. We do not stop sinning when we become Christians. That doesn't happen. What happens when we become Christians is that it becomes possible for us to stop sinning. It becomes finally possible that we can break free from sin. We have the power of Christ to deliver us from sin. We have his righteousness that enables us to not keep sinning. And so when we were formerly in bondage, we now have freedom. The accuser, the devil, wants to say that we aren't really made right, that we're so broken that we can't possibly ever have victory over sin. But what, what this passage tells us, what, what Paul is telling us in this passage is that we have the righteousness of God protecting us, even from ourselves. As G.G. Finlay puts it, the completeness of pardon for past offense and the integrity of character that belongs to the justified life, the, the made righteous life, that's what that means, are woven together into an impenetrable mail. Mail as in, like, armor. So that's, that's the second image. The third image are the shoes. You can see these shoes down here. They're not like the shoes we wear today. Paul talks about shoes that will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. Satan is the divider. He wants to divide us up, break us apart, reconstruct walls of hostility between us. And what the call of the Christian is to break down divisions by proclaiming the gospel. The gospel is what reunites us to God and one another. And Satan wants to keep us divided. And so Paul says here, you're going to have to be on the march. Just like the Roman soldier needed these shoes to march, you're going to have to be on the march looking for places where people are divided and bringing them back together. I want to ask you, as the church... Are we ready to proclaim the gospel at all times and all places? Are we soldiers for Christ marching on? Are we ready? Are we prepared to go where God might call us to go? Jackie Pullinger once remarked, God wants us to have soft hearts and hard feet. The trouble with so many of us is that we have soft feet and hard hearts. We need to harden our feet by putting on the shoes of a soldier, ready for the march, ready to go where God is calling us to go. Fourth, the shield of faith. I could spend a long time talking about each of these, but we're gonna go, I want to go through all of them. So the shield of faith. So you see this big, long shield. This is, there's two different types of shields that the Roman soldiers had. This one was the big one that they used when they were being shot at with flaming arrows. And it had a special layer in it that would extinguish those, that was soaked in water. So to put out those flaming arrows. So it would cover their whole body, this big shield. Satan is the accuser. So in addition to being the tempter, in addition to being a liar, he's also the accuser. And as Christians, we believe that we've been made righteous by faith in Christ's atoning death. And so there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But what Satan likes to do is he likes to still accuse us as if we're still guilty for past sins that God has forgiven us of. He accuses us. He attacks us. He tells us that we're not worthy of God's love, that we aren't really forgiven. 
And sometimes he even tries to make us feel guilty for things that aren't even sinful. I can tell you the number of times that people have come to me wanting to confess a sin that wasn't actually a sin. They're being accused by Satan. They're letting those flaming darts get through their shield of faith. They're not trusting in God's forgiveness and his mercy. We must continually put our trust in Jesus so that we can extinguish these flaming arrows. John Stott says this. He says, faith lays hold of the promises of God in times of doubt and depression. And faith lays hold of the power of God in times of temptation. What he's saying there is that trusting in God alone gives us a shield that can extinguish the fiery darts of Satan. When we put our trust in men, we're going to be disappointed. When we put our trust in systems and structures, we're going to be disappointed. But when we put our trust in the Lord God Almighty, he will never disappoint us and he will protect us. Last, the, no, not, not quite last, but fifth, the helmet of salvation. So you see the cap that he has on his head. Satan comes as a destroyer. He lives to spread death and destruction. But in Christ, God has delivered us from death. He saved us. That's what it means when we say we're saved. And if we lose our heads, quite literally, we lose our lives. But it's also true on a spiritual level. When we lose our heads, we lose our lives. When we lose our perspective, our eternal perspective, when we lose the perspective of eternal salvation, we start to lose our heads and we start to lose our lives. People lose their minds when they're not living out of a place of security in their salvation. So I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, our salvation is secure. If you have put your trust in Jesus, your salvation is secure. And so as you face these incredible battles in this life, you can approach them with confidence that you are going to be safe. And then last, the sword of the Spirit. So you see that little short sword that the Roman soldiers carry? Paul says, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Satan is defenseless against us, but he tries to pass himself off as all-powerful. He roams around, Scripture says, like, like a hungry lion looking for someone to devour, but the reality is that he has no power against the word of God. He tried that once against the word of God. Satan thought he could kill the word of God. He thought he could destroy the word made flesh. But three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. He's powerless now. Paul is not just referring to Jesus, however, he's also referring to God's word written to the Bible, the word of God. Scripture is our offensive weapon against Satan and his army. You cannot fight with the sword of the Spirit if you do not have the Word of God in hand. Did you hear what I just said? You can't fight with the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God written, if you don't have it in your hand. Are you keeping the Scriptures close to you at all times? Is it imprinted on your mind and in your heart, ready for when you're attacked? Many of us are showing up to battle unarmed. Every day we are in a spiritual battle, so every day we need our spiritual weapon, the Word of God, the Bible, the Scriptures. All of us, Christians and non-Christians alike, are engaged in this battle. And before we were in Christ, we were in a battle against God. We were enemies of Christ, Scripture says. But when we turn and fight against the demonic and spiritual forces of wickedness, when we turn against our former way of life, we are protected by God's armor. He gives us his armor. We take God's side. We enlist ourselves in his army, not the devil's. St. Chrysostom, who is an early Christian saint, one of, he was called the Golden Mouth because he's such a great preacher, he has a, a, a sermon on this passage, and he writes this in that sermon. The war against the demonic puts an end to the previous war against God. As we are making war with the devil, we are making peace with God. Have no fear, beloved. The victory is already won. This is the good news. That's the good news. Those who used to battle against God are now empowered to fight for God. I'm pleading with you today. This is my final plea. 
and then I'll stop talking. Don't go after flesh and blood. They aren't the real enemy. We have plenty of enemies that we need to do battle with as Christians. Don't go after flesh and blood. Go after the spiritual forces of wickedness. Take up the whole armor of God, the belt of truth. Speak the truth at all times. The breastplate of righteousness. Know that you can be different. You have been transformed by the gospel. Gospel shoes, ready to go. Hard feet, ready to go where God calls you to go. A shield of faith, putting your trust in God when you feel attacked and assailed. The helmet of salvation, knowing with security that you are saved. The sword of the spirit, the word of God to strike back at all the falsehoods of the devil. Resist Satan and he will flee from you. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Amen.